I got to be honest with you guys. This week, we are a little more heavy on the Idaho 4, which I swear our viewers love right now. I think everyone's obsessed with the Idaho 4 case. Uh, there's just so many questions. There was a recent hearing recently, uh, and uh, there's just a lot going on in it and a lot of unanswered questions. And you know what's interesting is I, I bet if they took off the gag order... I bet interest would drop. Well, maybe it would increase for a minute, but I bet it would drop really quick. Once everybody got the answers um, and they're, yeah, I think a lot of interest would drop. Not all of it. I mean, to this day, people still are interested in the Watts case um, and many other cases that, you know, grip the nation at one time. But like with how much coverage this case gets, um, yeah, that would, I think, significantly drop. I agree. Yeah. I agree. All right. So I guess we will start with the most important cases for our viewers, right? For our viewers. I think every case is equally important when there's a victim. Um, but uh, the the interest of the community. And, and why I'm saying that is because I put out a, uh, a poll last week and i asked what was it exactly i said uh we have intentionally refrained from covering certain topics in the idaho four sphere for a multitude of reasons what theory topic idea speculation would you like to hear us cover most in relation to the idaho four case now as you guys can see here on the screen uh, Brent Kopaka was number one, and uh, it's not that surprising. We have intentionally refrained from that for a while, um, but uh, we're going to be talking about Brent Kopaka, Jack Showalter, and uh, getting into it from there. So uh, how are we starting tonight? Are we starting with one of my cases, or would you like to start? You can start with yours. All right. So. Let's get into Idaho for Brent Kopaka. Now, my my, I this is one of the topics where I intentionally didn't bring a lot of details. I have enough to walk everyone through it, right? Because we have so many international viewers. We had like literally like ninety percent of our viewers are international. I, I swear. Um, we have so many people that come to YouTube that have come to this chat right here, right here. Wait, is it? No, over here, over here on this side of the screen, this chat right over here. Uh, because of Thought Riot Podcast, I, I still to this day get a ton of comments where they're like, you know, I was never big on YouTube before, but I started listening to you guys and then uh, I'm here now, you know, which is incredible. Absolutely incredible. And and why I'm saying that, like why that's important here is because anybody that is on YouTube and has been on YouTube for a long time, uh, more than likely is part of the true crime rotation. There are some big true crime creators out there that follow a lot of the mainstream topics and put out a bunch of videos on these topics. And uh, if you're on YouTube, more than likely you've seen some of these, right? But a lot of our viewers that are coming to YouTube for Thought Riot Podcast uh, do, do, don't do watch a lot of these other creators. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they aren't getting the same information like in this situation with Brent Kopaka as a lot of viewers. And, you know, Ian... Ha has been asking us to cover this for a long time. Really? A long time. Yeah. All right. So who is Brent Kopaka and why is he interesting in the Idaho 4 case? Okay. So the Idaho 4 case where uh, we have the victims, uh, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, Kaylee Gonsalves, and currently have uh, Brian Koberger, who is uh, charged by the state of Idaho in defending himself against the Idaho 4 massacre. Now, 
Brent Kopaka did not have any connections here, okay? And the the only way we're going to be able to dig into this is to look at it objectively, all right? And uh, the, the, the only way to objectively look at this is to give everyone the full rundown of the situation. Yes. It's, it's a, it's kind of a lot to understand, honestly, if you've never heard it before. It is. All right. So Brent Kopaka is a 36 year old, uh, ex military. I, I don't know if you would say ex military because I believe he was honorably discharged, which I, I didn't write that down here. Do you remember if he's honorably discharged? I know he had, uh, some issues. So I think it was honorable medical discharge, which in my opinion is super important. Do you remember? No, I don't okay. remember. Uh, I, it's just really important because it's one of the reasons why we've delayed talking about this for so long, you guys, because um, this is a military veteran who willingly put his life on the line to protect the U.S., to protect our interests. He ended up getting hurt in battle. He got the Purple Heart. Uh, while in combat, he was an airborne army uh, combat soldier, and uh, it, it it always it always gives me pause when I see someone that committed to our country in such a way to openly go down a potential rabbit hole around if they could be guilty of a crime with no objective evidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I do. Um, I just want to be very aware when we're talking about this that we we do not take this topic lightly. Uh, we think it, he deserves the absolute and utmost respect here. Um, but this again is one of those topics that we've made a commitment to our viewers that we will talk about absolutely everything, no matter what it is, and we're just going to do it in a respectful fashion, right? So, uh, Brent Kopaka was 36 and, uh, he was fatally shot by the WSU police sergeant, Brent, Brett Boyd in Pullman, Washington. Um, it was approximately 31 days after the Idaho four massacre. Now, it, when I'm trying to remember why this took hold in such a way that it did. Um, I think it, I think if I'm looking back, right, where Brent Kopaka really started coming into the picture is on 1215 is when this happened. Okay. And the situation, you guys, th this is the overview. And then we're going to do other videos where we dig further into the evidence. We have a FOIA we've already submitted and we've got a ton of stuff sitting here. But just to get our viewers updated, um, on 12-15 of 2022, there was a call in, or police say there was a call in. That's one of the pieces of evidence that was that's in question, uh, saying that there was a hostage situation at the apartments that Brent Kopaka lived on. Now, remember, on 12-15, that is before Brian Koberger. That is before anybody had ever been named as a suspect, which no one did in the Idaho four case until Brian Koberger. Yeah. They didn't announce they had a suspect until he was already arrested. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it makes me think that because at the entire world's eyes was on Idaho at this time, this situation happened, which already is uncommon in this area. They don't have a suspect. So people start automatically thinking and drawing connections like, oh, maybe this has to do with the Idaho four. Well, let's find out. Right. And I think that's really where the interest interest started coming in. But you know, what's interesting here is there's a lot of evidence that suggests some very Big coincidences between uh, Brent Kopaka and Brian Koberger. There are some weird coincidences. There are some weird ones. Um, 
And we'll get into like the details of those when we go further in our other videos. But, uh, you know, just to give you a taste. So d Brian Koberger and Brent Kopaka lived within 15 minutes of each other in Pennsylvania and in Washington. That's one that sticks with me. That is very strange. Very, very, very strange. Because that is a very big coincidence. To live on the East Coast, general, pretty much on the East Coast, 15 minutes away from somebody, and around the same time of moving, move all the way to the West Coast and randomly live 15 minutes away from somebody, but you don't know them? That's a strange one. I think when people heard that, they were like, that... That's a big coincidence. It is a really weird coincidence. Like, it, it is really odd. I mean, I don't know what it means, but. It's strange. It's, it is strange. Yeah, it's, it's strange. But um, at the same time, it's like, when you think about it, like, well, why would they do that, though? Like, yeah, it's a weird coincidence, but. Why would they live 15 minutes apart? Like, why would they, they're grown men. Why would they follow each other, you know? Yeah. And pretend they don't know each other. Yeah. I, I don't. live separate lives, but live like 10, I don't minutes know. Away. And, and you know, on the night of the crime, um, they believe that Brian Koberger drove to Brent Kopaka's apartments. Who believes that? The community in general, the people that are interested in the Brent Kopaka story. So the theory is that Koberger drove that way? Yeah, that drove to Brent Kopaka's apartments. Brent Kopaka's parents also owned uh, a white Hyundai Elantra. So the Brent Kopaka story, you guys, to give you a, a rundown here, like I was saying with uh, being in the apartment and uh, it was um, a really horrible situation where we don't even know all of it. We have no idea, right? Even through the body cam, even through everything, there are certain aspects of the Brent Kopaka situation that nobody understands. Um, but there, according to police was a nine one one call that somebody placed and, uh, they and said it was a roommate. That's what they say. The cops. Yeah. Nothing can be confirmed. They won't release that nine one one call. Um, but they, they claim there's a nine one one call that was a roommate. Um, and uh, called in and said that they were, it was a hostage situation in their apartment. Well, he said, I mean, the roommate supposedly said, Brent Kopaka is trying to kill us. He's threatening to kill us, right? N no, I didn't hear that uh, from the interview where the police officer talks about the 911 call. I didn't hear that. And, and that's the big question is, Nobody knows what's on that 911 call. It won't be released. They're claiming they don't have it. So nobody knows. The How roommates, can they not have it? The roommates both claim they did not make that call. That's where the, all this question comes from. This is why people think that it could be some sort of setup because there is no connection of how they got to Brunt. Brent Kopaka's apartment. Hmm. So when, uh, however the police got there, which is already strange. Okay. At these apartments, um, there's a lot of body cam footage of the roommates talking to the police and the body cam footage. It, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like, they're afraid for their lives. Even though we were told that this was a hostage situation, there were no roommates in the apartment. Brent Kopaka was alone in the apartment by himself, okay? Police end up breaching after uh, shooting him dead. Um, 
And ultimately, through all of this, his phone was wiped clean and left on the counter table. Now, some other interesting aspects of this is when you look at hostage situations or holdup situations, uh, what police normally do is they'll reach out to a family member. They'll reach out to a friend. Uh, they'll try and get someone personal that has a connection with Brent Kopaka in this situation. Uh, but that didn't happen. Yeah. You mean during like when they're trying to deescalate. So you, so while they, while he was in there in the apartment alone and they were like, the cops are all outside, the SWAT team was called and they, you know, were trying to talk him down or whatever. Um, they should have had somebody like a de-escalation expert who gets in contact, like you said, with like a family member or a friend and have that person talk to them because they know that person. And that can sometimes like bring them back to reality or remember what matters or, you know, it can be really helpful. Yeah. Um, and that didn't happen. And no, it did happen. Well, it did. You're they, right. It, they called did, his friend, but... Darren Duncan, and said, hey, do you know Brent Kopaka? And he said, yeah, what's going on? And tried to understand. And she said, okay, well, something along the lines of we'll call you back, okay? Uh, they never call him back. They never try and get Brent Kopaka the phone. They never try and de-escalate the situation. Uh, the next thing that happens is they they you know, put a bullet through him. Which you don't even get to see on body cam. Like it's not on any officer's body cam. There's a lot of strange things on that body cam. However, we got to stay on point with, is this connected to the Idaho four? Right. Um, I think there was a major injustice done here when it comes to Brent Kopaka. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, it, a lot of things should have happened that didn't happen. I don't know why this area has such an issue with being open, with clear communication, letting the public in on what's going on. That 911 call should have been released like every other case in the entire U.S. Why it wasn't, I have no idea. Why was his phone wiped? I have no idea. Uh, why did... Brent Kopaka live within 15 minutes of Brian Koberger all the way across the United States. I have no idea. I don't know. A lot of people theorize, though, that when Brent Kopaka was talking, he, uh, the police or people that believe the current police story believe he was saying that, uh, something about his roommates, but people that believe there's a connection here with Brent Kopaka. And remember, I'm just trying to give everyone the basic rundown of the story. So then when we do the next video, we'll go into the deep, the details of the story. People who believe there's a connection here to the Idaho four believe Brent Kopaka was talking about the roommates. Idaho for roommates that he was making comments and suggestions that he knew something about the college roommates. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's also really like, you can't really hear him talk in the body cam either, at least from what I heard. No, you can't. You get no real verification, which I'm not trying to go down conspiracy hole here, okay? I When I watch the body cam, I feel like it looks like any other body cam. It looks fine, right? The police, I feel like, that are outside the door are doing what they should. They're very uh, consciously aware of where bullets could come from because according to what they all know, Brent Kopaka had a gun, okay? They yeah. need to be acting with safety of themselves for a suspect that has a gun. I understand that. I am not trying to call out all these police officers that were trying to do their job, okay? Um, my big question is the 911 call because, and, and this is, this is what's important, okay? We've seen people get killed over being swatted. Yep. It's a very 
serious situation when you've swatted people. I've unfortunately seen families get swatted where there were kids home and somebody online thought it was funny to do that. And for anybody watching us that doesn't know what swatted means, it's where you call where somebody, a, a, an online troll and a troll, you know, trying to cause harm with creators or uh, media people, whatever, they'll call 911 in that area and say, hey, there's somebody at this address that has a gun that is threatening on ending the, the rest of the people's lives that are in that area. What's police going to do? They're going to show up guns blazing, ready to go in. OK, and there were there have been multiple occasions where police had end up shooting people dead and they didn't have a gun. There was nothing going on there. So. Did that happen in this situation? Was Brent Kopaka connected to the Idaho four case in some way with Brian Koberger in some way? And this was some kind of cleanup. I think these are the questions the community is asking, and I think it's going to be up to us to look through the evidence and try and figure out if there's anything objectively to connect here. Because, look, I don't believe what happened to Brent Kopaka was okay. I think that mistakes were made. I think that uh, in situations where we're dealing with uh, ex-military and the police knew he was ex-military, uh, there should be some additional considerations that should be had uh, in these situations. Now, in the body cam, they claim Brent Kopaka fired his gun. Uh, I, do, I don't know how I feel about that. Had, have you seen that footage? I mean, I didn't hear a gunfire. I, I didn't either, but the claim is that he fired his gun. My question when I watch the, the body cam footage is it doesn't seem like he's firing a rifle, which is what they said he had a rifle or a shotgun, a larger gun. Okay. Uh, maybe the popping we hear in the body cam could be like a 22 or something very small caliber handgun. Um, but it, it, it is not a larger gun, a shouldered gun, uh, that's being fired there. And what's important with police is police should be matching aggression in these situations. Yeah, he didn't seem very aggressive. You don't hear anything from him. No. In the body cam. Nothing. They were literally like sending drones and stuff in there to get proof of life. And, you know, like, I think there might be one part I kind of remember hearing him yell or something. And they were talking about getting him like a cigarette. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I might remember. I honestly need to go back and re-listen. Yeah, I need to go back and re-listen too. But the important thing is walking people through what this connection is. Now, again, I, I just want to be overly sensitive in this situation because like I said, with Kopaka serving in the, the U.S. Army. So he served in the Army between 2005 and 2009 in the 2nd Battalion, 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment. He was a 4th Br Brigade Combat Team soldier, veteran, in the 82nd Airborne Division. And he was awarded the Purple Heart for his service in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, where he sustained uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, which happens from being blown up, um, which happens from, uh, you know, it hitting your head it, it hard. I, people have gotten it from, you know, taking a round in the helmet. Um, there, there's, no, there's no reason or rhyme to TBI. And TBI is such a problem that we see in boxers and we see in football players when we see uh, in our soldiers. So like TBI is scary stuff. It is scary. And it's super sad. It's super sad. It's scary. We've covered stories before where we've talked about, um, and I, I, I don't want to connect this with him. Okay. So that's not where I'm going, but we've talked about some serial enders in the past 
that there is some kind of connection to TBI, but normally it happens prepubescent in yeah. those serial enders. Yeah, they're like developing stuff. Yep, yeah, a prepubescent brain injury or head injury, which caused some kind of damage to that frontal lobe, which we've seen turn into some kind of sociopathic disconnection. That's true, but I think I... I need to go relook it up, but I do think I've heard of one who was not a child, who was an adult, and their whole life changed after the brain injury. They like became a whole different person. I mean, you know who else claims that is uh, Alex. Uh, what's his last name? Um, you guys are probably saying it for me right now. The the Alex Jones. Alex Jones. Alex Jones says that. Really? Yes. Yes. He got hit by a car. And uh, his entire character changed. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. I've I've heard that from numerous places about the care. You know who you are, like in your character, or whatever changing. Um, but like you said, when it's somebody developing into like a serial killer, usually it's in adolescence when they suffer like a severe head trauma. And there's a lot of those cases. Like there's these certain hallmarks and markers and head trauma can be one of them. Um, usually not in adulthood, though, even if it does change your whole personality. But I do believe there's one killer who had it in adulthood. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it just because of how me how much it can change people. But it's on a case-by-case -case basis, too. And sure. what's interesting here is, like I said, Brent Kopaka was in the military until 09, okay? So that gave him, what, uh, fi what 15 years? So 22, yeah, fit right? 13 years or something? Or 16 uh, but Wait, he's, he's what been year? Oh, nine. Okay. So that's 2019. So 13 years. So he had been th out of the military for 13 years and, uh, yep. And he had been dealing with the TBI PTSD. He had PTSD he had TBI, and he had been managing that so, at, at least effectively to have his own apartment. And in my opinion, that says a lot. What in the last 16 years would cause someone all of a sudden in a way to lose it, you know? Did he have his own apartment? Yeah, he lived there. That was his apartment. Yeah, but you know, I, I don't remember where I heard this, but I've heard that I mean, it wasn't his apartment, and I don't know if he legitimately, like, I don't know if he just moved in and started living there, or, I don't know. There's some weird stuff around his living, too. Around his living? Yeah. Statements from people who did live there. What, that he was couch surfing or something? Kinda, I think. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to look into that when we dig into this more. Yeah, um, I, I do need to look into it more. Yeah, we just wanted to give uh, the the overview. Now, this needs to be brought up with it, okay? Um, because some very big creators have drawn these connections out there. Um, so there had been animals going missing. And for some, not animals going missing, animals getting hurt, animals being mutilated in the area. For some reason... Uh, Jack is connected to this in these theories, and Brent Kopaka is connected to this in these hoodie, theories. Hoodie guy. Yeah. So, um, and I, they not only were they going missing and being mutilated, they were then turning up on fraternity front steps, like people's front yards, too. fraternities, sororities. And I honestly think it might have been other neighbors, too, not just fraternities and sororities. But the most notable ones I can think of are the fraternity and sorority because of how bad it was. Um, but yeah, turning up in yards and front porches like somebody was putting it there on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you know what's interesting? And in, in the early reports with the Brent Kopaka story, you know they were saying that he worked in the IT department for WSU? Oh, really? Yeah. IT, Brian Koberger, 
Hello. In the early reports? In the early reports, yep. So it changed to, he he then was a security guard at WSU. But a lot of people have drawn connection here because technology and technology. And if you're going to school for criminal-based technology, like cloud-based forensics, you would be heavily involved in the IT department in your school. Well, was there some kind of connection there? Other people have theorized, did Brian Koberger know Br Brent Kopaka because maybe Brent Kopaka reached out on his survey? It, these are all interesting questions, interesting questions. And I've got to be honest with you guys, though. I'm worried about being able to come up with very concrete, objective evidence for these questions. I think part of the reason this has gotten so big is because we we don't have answers for these questions. Yeah. But I also think this is a very big coincidence, too. That's what I was going to ask you is if we have any idea what he did for work. Uh, I like, mean, like what was Brent Kopaka doing for a job? Security like, is what it says. So he was either security or uh, in the IT department with WSU. Interesting. And he worked for WSU. And he had a big knife collection. There had been some Wait. very weird things said about him. But yes, he worked for WSU. Whether it was IT or whether it was security, he worked at WSU is what the reports claim. Have I seen a paycheck? No, I haven't seen a paycheck. But this is what the reports say. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Yep. And, uh, you know, there, did he work at DeSales? <laughs> that, I, don't, I don't know. Um, you know, there's been, there's been some advocates that have come out for Brent Kopaka. One of them is a Darren Duncan, which who we talked about just a minute ago, uh, was actually the person who was called by law enforcement and never called back to try and get him in contact with his friend, which, and I haven't seen this called out anywhere. So why didn't they tell Darren to call Brent? His phone was on the counter wiped. Why know. didn't they yell through the speaker to like plug your phone in? Darren Duncan's trying to call you. Or just, you know, fly one of those drones in there remote control car with a phone on it. Yeah, so, I don't know. Darren Duncan has been avidly fighting against people connecting Brent Kopaka to the Idaho 4, which I understand that. I understand that. I I it, it, if one of my very best friends and good friends was a soldier and dedicated his life, literally his life, limb and freedom to the safety of the country, uh, only to be connected to a potential mass homicide, which there's nothing that says he wasn't connected and trying to stop it either. Okay. He, maybe he's connected it in a way where he's trying to be the good guy. Maybe he heard something we, we don't know. Okay. I think most people automatically go to a negative connection. Like, Brent Kopaka can be a dangerous guy. He had a knife collection. He was a, a, an army trained combat veteran. Uh, he had the capabilities of doing this. What's interesting, though, is like with the Idaho 4, none of us have actual factual confirmation of how long that crime took to be committed. So, does that change the storyline in the Idaho Four? Just going tin hat here. If someone doesn't only have nine minutes to complete it, could an average person without any training do this in 45 minutes? Could they have done this in two different situations where two of the roommates came home first you know, did this, shut the door, clean themselves up, walk through the house, left no marks, and then waited in the closet for the two women. Hmm. 
I think uh, being somebody who has no experience, I think it would be really, really hard to not leave anything behind and be quick. Um, but like, I guess, see, here's an argument that's been said from for a long time now from people mainly who think Brian Cooper is 100 percent guilty and will not see anything like won't see it any other way, which that's your prerogative. That's your right. That's whatever. Um, but it's that all the evidence points to Brian Koberger. However, all the evidence points to Brian Koberger because we have a PCA that was written to point to Brian Koberger. What if there's a bunch more evidence that doesn't, and we're not going to hear about it because this is Brian Koberger's trial. I, I've said that from the beginning because so, of the Karen Reed case. Right. Exactly. So what if there is evidence somebody was there in, you know, say cleaned up because there's no tracking of, you know, footprints with like fluid on them going through the home and indications of someone being there a lot longer, but it doesn't fit into their timeline and they have the car here and here at this time. And they're like, well, it, ha it has to be this way. So I don't like, that doesn't really make sense, but like it literally has to be between this time and this time, because that's when he gets here and that's when he leaves. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I, I do know. I, I just, what if somebody, because they're focusing on that car and that person, they don't see the person you know, on foot, sneaking out the through the woods evidence, an yeah. hour later. Yeah, and no, I, I agree with you that that biased evidence for sure. I I think that we see that really big in the the cell phone evidence, whereas, uh, you know, they only pulled a very short time frame of cell phone evidence for for the data drop from the tower when they should have pulled the entire week leading up to it, in my opinion, um, to see what kind of connections there were in that area, you know, to that tower, which would have been a lot of data. But let's be real here. We're over a year in and uh, they still haven't shared all the evidence. So they would have had time to filter through everything. Now, Another interesting connection between Brian Koberger and Brent Kopaka is when Brian Koberger is pulled over two times in Indiana, he mentions the Brent Kopaka situation in both of them. Well, his dad. No, nope, he did. Koberger brought them up first? Yes. Yes. Yep. His dad finishes his sentence because he's closer to the officer, but... Brian Koberger says it first, and then his dad picks up the conversation. Yes. That's really weird. It is a little strange, but you got to remember that Brian Koberger was a WSU student, meaning his cell phone was uploaded into the college uh, database, so he would be getting alerts when to shelter. And yeah. Brent Kopaka had an eight hour standoff, you guys. Eight hour standoff during this situation. Yeah. The the reset hmm. phone is really strange. The reset phone is really strange. And you know, there have been other creators out there, other creators that we respect, that we love, that we like a lot, that have highlighted other things too. Like I, you know, Brent Kopaka had a knife collection, but I know a ton of people who have a knife collect collection that doesn't make you guilty, right? We can't fall into the same traps that we're speaking out against with Brian Koberger. Whereas, oh, well, this person has this thing, so they must have done it. No, we can't do that. We got to look at Brent Kopaka objectively. What is some objective connections here with Brian Koberger, right? He liked knives. Okay, so that means he had the ability to have a weapon that could have done this crime, right? He was obsessed with horror movies. Well, that's interesting. I'm obsessed with horror movies. You know, I didn't go out and end people's lives last night because I like horror movies. Um, but great point. <laughs> I think the interesting evidence is the fact that they lived literally a stone's throw apart from each other on either coast from Pennsylvania to Washington. That's a big deal. 
That's a very big deal. It is a big deal. Very big deal. They both worked and or went to school at WSU. Okay. That, that, that really sells me more than anything. Is that they worked at the same place. They are unwilling to release the 911 call. He, Who's on that call? He wiped his phone. No, no, no. The yeah, that's that's a big deal too. But on that nine one one call, who is on that call? Right. When somebody calls into nine one one, there's only two people: the dispatcher and the person calling in. Why aren't they willing to let us hear the person that's calling in? Especially if it's just one of the roommates saying, "Hey, he's trying to kill me." It right, but it's not. Yeah, but they like that's such a weird thing to hold back if it's just his roommate saying, hey, he's trying to kill me. Um, I mean, it's weird that why is it? Why does this area of the country not want to give 911 calls? It's really weird, especially it's with weird. these cases. It's weird because then it, that's not normal. It's not normal to not give a 911 call. It's not normal. And and then to try and condemn the general public like us here who are interested in the safety of our civilization um, and have interest in cases like these to make people like us or the people like you watching this uh, make all of us feel bad because we have an interest here is absolutely wrong and absolutely absurd. This is public information and these things are supposed to be released so we can understand how safe we really are. Like the, our country is supposed to be a democracy here, you know, meaning we vote and or control these institutions. I agree with you. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense you know, and it draws really nasty conclusions when people are trying to understand what's going on. Exactly. Exactly. And if this case is closed, which it is, according to Washington State Police, um, they have concluded there was no wrongdoing by the police officer who shot him, which I don't agree with. Um but they've, this is case closed. That's why we have the body cam now. That's why we have any information because for the longest time, nobody could get anything. It was locked tight. You couldn't get nothing because it was still under investigation. They were investigating the officers who shot him. Well, case closed, then give us everything. Why I continue agree. to hide things? It's like Hudson Lindau. If he just had an accidental drowning, why not give the autopsy findings? You know? Mm -hmm. Like, why do we have to go off the coroner's word? That's not yeah. fair to the public. If it's you not. want the public to trust you, you have to be transparent. Yeah. You have to give the reports. I agree. I not agree. just expect us to take you at your word. Yeah. That's not acceptable. This is America, okay? But this is video one. On the Brent Kopaka subject, and we'll be diving into it a lot more. I hope I gave you guys a really good rundown, really thorough into some of the speculation and some of the why behind people are interested in this. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and let those thoughts riot. And let us know if you want us to go deeper down the rabbit hole. I mean, we are. We are. Well, There's actual evidence. This is just video one. You can. Tell us still, though. <laughs> yeah.